Um, just working it. There we go. All right. So the way I'll go through the uh, talk for habitology, uh, there'll be about eight cases with questions. Um, I think for the chat there, if you to access the recorded talks afterwards, if you speak to the organisers. Uh, so we'll go through eight cases that should take you through uh, some uh, uh, clear hepatology cases that we see and that you might see as general paediatricians, general paediatric registrars, etc. Uh, and through each age of children. If you have worked at King's or done a hepatology attachment, I hope you found this quite easy. If not, I hope you get some good pointers. All right. So just to tell you how important hepatology is, uh, this is Liver Eating Johnson, who is an American and who married uh, a lady from the Flathead Indian tribe, but who was killed by someone from another tribe. And he got his revenge by eating the liver of every man he killed. And this was a huge insult um, because the American Indians believed that the liver was essential if you wanted to go on to the afterlife after death. So as paediatricians, we have to look after our children's livers because obviously we do want them to go on be successful adults and ultimately go on to the afterlife if you believe in that. And other cultures also have the liver as being very important. Uh, in Asian cultures, it's about courage and power and being the best. Zulu, courage again. Although in, in Greece, it was more about anger and jealousy and greed, but still important. You should be confident about hepatology, although you don't see it more, because if you go back to ancient Greece, uh, Prometheus, uh, the story there, stole fire from Zeus, was tied to a rock where an eagle would peck out his liver. But of course, the liver is great at regenerating uh, and it came back every day. So be confident uh, with liver disease because to be positive, the liver will regenerate. That makes hepatology a good field to go into. All right, so let's get on with the talk. Okay, so here's the first case. So a baby was hypoglycemic on the postnatal ward. He reviewed the blood results. There's a previous neonatal sibling who died in the history. So have a look at the uh, blood results there can see. Um, anything striking out anybody? Or does everybody think they're normal? If you think they're normal, you're going to be in a bit of trouble. Okay, so we can see that the ALT is a little bit raised at 103. Uh, Billy Rubin is slightly high, 170. And yeah, somebody's commented that INR, uh, that's obviously the biggest worry, 3.2. Good. So does anyone want to comment? What would you do next? You're the pediatric reg called to the neonatal or the postnatal ward to see this baby. Any offers? Okay, so the majority of people are saying give vitamin K, and that's quite right, I hope. Yes, because of course the INR is abnormal, could be just vitamin K deficiency, you could solve that problem. You don't want any complications of that INR, so you want to try and correct that. Uh, first. So the right thing to do first out of these choices anyway is to give uh, vitamin K. Of course some of your other answers there are right but we can only do one thing at a time uh, on the talk at least anyway. Uh, so we said I know is high, we said we'd give vitamin K. Uh, some of you are, are putting in your next steps such as manage for sepsis which is correct. Sepsis would be a good cause for this. So we're thinking about uh, other causes of this. We'll talk about what it could be. 
And in fact, this, these are all real cases. This was a baby with gestational alloimmune liver disease, or what used to be called neonatal hemochromatosis. And uh, let me just see, so that's another case. Let's go back one. Why? So some of you have put, <coughs> put this be galactosemia. It's a very early to present with galactosemia on the first day of life. <coughs> Someone said, could it be biliary atresia? It couldn't be biliary atresia. They don't present with liver failure. So this baby's got liver failure. The clotting is deranged. I'm presuming it did not correct with vitamin K. And the other things to note, already day one of life, newborn, it's already got a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So that means this liver disease has been going on in utero. Also, the albumin is low. So this is end stage chronic liver disease. So it's really presenting with a liver that's not functioning anymore, uh, end stage chronic liver disease. And that type of presentation uh, would fit uh, with uh, neonatal hemochromatosis, a disease that happens in utero, alloimmune liver disease. And this baby is being born with an end stage liver disease. So somebody asked why are the platelets low? I think that just reflects that this is a very sick baby uh, with an end stage uh, disease. So you can read about that if you wish, there's plenty of papers. Now another case, this baby's a little bit older. Let's have a think about those uh, numbers. Uh, so this baby had been at home, comes into uh, A&E. So anyone can put some comments up about these numbers. Hepatitis, yes, that's a very good answer. The ALT is very high. Um, it's obviously neonatal hepatitis because it's neonate, so yes. So you have to think of your causes of neonatal hepatitis. Okay, so you're all thinking about infection, which is great. Viruses, which is great. Anybody think the INR is uh, abnormal? I hope so. So again, you should be worrying about this baby with an INR like that. So let's see the question. So I think most of you are already answering this. I think most people are going to go for, have been saying infection. So that's B. So let's have a look. It was B. Uh, why? Well, you're right, people who've been saying this, a very high ALT, so very, uh, ALT is an enzyme that's released when hepatocytes uh, are killed, or apoptose, if you like. Uh, so there's a lot of acute damage going on to this liver. And a common cause at five days of old would be infection. And the particular infection that you have to think about in babies with liver failure with a very high ALT or AST is HSV. And I think a couple of people uh, said HSV. So uh, people are right saying sepsis, that's correct. You would screen for sepsis, obviously this baby's unwell, you're gonna treat for sepsis. But in an infant, you should be thinking of viruses, you should be thinking of HSV. So you must cover for that, start your acyclovir and send off uh, the PCR for HSV to see if that's present. And so if you remember the from the first baby, the ALT was not particularly high. So that's something that was more chronic, been going on a long time. This one is something that's presenting very acutely with a, a very acute damage to that liver, and that would fit more with uh, infection. The liver will uh, recover from an acute insult, like an infection or like a toxic insult. But a liver with uh, that high AST, INR 3.7, is a worry that you won't recover and get through that uh, liver failure till the liver regenerates, if you like. So some things we've done, for example, is put liver cells into the peritoneum wrapped in alginate, um, to, and they function as liver, as hepatocytes. Uh, they don't reject because the immune cells can't get through the alginate coating, and that allows some liver function to occur 
until the liver itself regenerates. So there's lots of things you can do. If you can't manage this and the child is too sick and doesn't get over the liver failure, they would need an, an uh, urgent transplant. Okay. Case number three, a little bit over again, older again. So I had a baby on day one of life, I've had a, a baby day uh, five, and now a 10 day old baby. So again, this baby's not very well. Uh, lethargy, vomiting, and irritability. A uh, little bit jaundice, blood sugars, 3.5, unwell, as I said, just a slightly large liver um, on examination. So please chat with your thoughts. Have a think. Okay, so again, uh, sepsis, of course, always in uh, neonatal presentations, you've got to think about sepsis. Other people thinking metabolic, could be. Somebody says, have they had a bolus? Well, absolutely, you need to uh, treat this baby, resuscitate appropriately. Okay, somebody's asking for blood results, so there you go. You're good enough to give blood results. Let's have a think of these blood results. What do you notice? So, yeah, again, very high transaminitis or high transaminases, I should say. Uh, high total bilirubin, 250, yeah. Haven't got the conjugated yet. Somebody mentions that the gamma GT is high. The gamma GT of 150 is actually normal uh, for a neonate. So they're born with a relatively high gamma GT, which goes down over the first week. So 150 is a normal gamma GT for a baby. Okay. So which test have you not got that you would like out of these choices? Okay, there's a bit of a, a split between split bilirubin and clotting profile. What I would say is, you know that this is a problem for this liver because the AST is already high. Uh, what you haven't got is clotting and what you can treat is clotting. And what is dangerous to you when that baby arrives is clotting. So the first test is definitely clotting that you want. You will ultimately need some more like, is this proper liver disease with split bilirubin? Um, but first is clotting to get, that's the emergency test. So never forget to do the clotting. If ever you need to call a liver unit at King's, please have the clotting because we will be asking for that. And of course, if it's abnormal, vitamin K first and then repeat it. Okay, so uh, you did get it right. You did do the clotting um, and there you go. That INR was 4.2, which is of course uh, very high. So again, this fits in the definition of liver failure. So any other tests you'd like to do? Any thoughts on the diagnosis? Okay, some good answers there. Ammonia. Um, Thinking about metabolic conditions, it's possible. HSV again, it is possible, it's only 10 days old. Albumin, uh, yeah, you'd probably get that on the LFTs. It's kind of helping you whether this is very acute or chronic, but I think with the AST this high, it's probably very acute. Okay. So now we're on to your differential diagnosis. 
who's got any thoughts on differential diagnosis now? Okay, bit of a mix so far from those that are answering. I encourage everybody else to put some answers in too. Um, probably the commonest is B. Why would you say B? The answer is this is liver failure. It would fit with sepsis, wouldn't it? With that INR fibrinogen and uh, liver dysfunction, slightly high white cell count. So it would certainly fit, and the age would fit with galactosemia. I think somebody said biliary atresia again. It wouldn't fit with that. It's too early, and they don't present with acute liver failure. Similarly, alpha-1 antitrypsin, and they don't present with acute liver failure. Uh, Wilson disease presents in older ages. Uh, so somebody put E. coli sepsis. Well, absolutely, E. coli sepsis uh, fits with this, and that's, again, why. Uh, galactosemia would be your best answer. And it was, in fact, uh, galactosemia. So their classic presentation is liver, acute liver failure and gram-negative sepsis. And you can read about those conditions at your leisure. So how do we define acute liver failure? Uh, so number one, it's acute. It's acute damage to the liver. And by acute, uh, we, as a kind of agreed definition, would say that it's within eight weeks from the onset of symptoms. So even though that first case obviously had a disease that had been going on in utero, nobody knew till the baby was born, so that counts. Similarly, if you're older and you do have Wilson disease, for example, if you present uh, acutely and nobody knew beforehand, it counts as acute liver failure. So acute liver damage, you have to have a coagulopathy. So if you replace all the vitamin K and you still have a coagulopathy, that counts. If the vitamin K uh, improves the INR, then obviously it was vitamin K deficiency. And the other thing, you can't count coagulopathy that's just due to sepsis or DIC. So it's coagulopathy from the liver damage. And finally, no known underlying liver disease. Uh, so some of the chronic liver diseases present acutely, uh, and if you didn't know they had them, it counts as acute liver failure. If you already knew they had a disease, then it would be an acute presentation of your chronic liver disease. In children, we don't have in the definition whether they have encephalopathy or not. Uh, and that's really because in children, it's much harder to diagnose encephalopathy than in adults. Obviously, babies, it's extremely difficult. We certainly think of encephalopathy, but it can't be in the di uh, diagnosis uh, or definition because it's just too difficult to diagnose. Um, as a cutoff for the coagulopathy, we would say an INR above two makes it count in the definition. And if we look at the causes of acute liver failure in children, this is our own data from King's. You can see that the majority, about two thirds, are idiopathic. So we don't find the cause in two thirds. Probably most of those were, in fact, uh, viral infections. After that, common causes are autoimmune hepatitis, that's AIH, drug induced uh, liver failure, so paracetamol would fit in that. Uh, metabolic, so this is uh, pediatric, so metabolic conditions are quite common. Uh, and viral infections also common. Met in adults, metabolic is much lower and drug induced is much higher. Then you need to split. So we've been talking about babies, so you need to split how they present. So there's an acute pattern and a chronic pattern. So the acute pattern is like the galactosemia presenting very acutely, very unwell, very high transaminases high INR, and the chronic pattern is more like the first uh, baby who was presenting with a kind of end-stage chronic liver disease uh, picture. So lower transaminases, obviously still in liver failure. Uh, so you can see there neonatal hemochromatosis presenting with the chronic kind of pattern, 
viral infections, galactosemia presenting with the acute pattern. You can see on that slide that you can have galactosemia presenting in different ways. Sometimes it just uh, presents uh, with jaundice, in fact, so we have to look for it. But the classic way uh, is a very acute presentation. Uh, just a question there was, what is NNH? That's neonatal hemochromatosis, now called gestational alloimmune liver disease. Okay, so just by looking at the blood tests and presentation can give you a really good idea of what might be the underlying diagnosis in the neonate. Uh, so you will be able to access this talk. So this is just what I've, I've said, really, the different ways they present. And you, can, you will get that as the kind of first uh, doctor to see this patient and do the first level blood tests will already point you in some good directions of what's wrong with the child. Once, you, once you've decided on your pathway, uh, then here's a little uh, investigations again, kind of second line investigations that you'd probably do in a district general or again as the, the first uh, pediatricians to see the baby. Uh, helping to point you to a diagnosis. So again, quite simple diagnosis uh, steps, most of those. Some of them obviously would be done uh, in the tertiary hospital, but those are the common investigations that we need to do. What about babies who present with jaundice? As you know, it's extremely common. Who do we investigate? So uh, more than two weeks or more than 20% conjugated or direct bilirubin. You must examine them and look at the stool. If they have a pale stool and dark urine, you have to investigate. Any bruising or bleeding, obviously worried about coagulopathy. Or any abnormal signs on examination, patomegaly, splenomegaly or jaundice and failing to thrive. And there, there are guidelines, NICE have guidelines of jaundice in newborn babies under 28 days, and you must follow those. Um, they are um, uh, children who've had diagnoses missed uh, and who end up in court. People do kind of re refer back to these guidelines and that tells you what to do as a, a more community doctor or a, a general pediatrician. So they're quite uh, straightforward. So just going through some questions uh, from Charlotte, which is a better marker, ALT or AST? So uh, they are both transaminases. They are both in hepatocytes. Uh, the difference is AST is also uh, more common in muscle tissue, so it can go up with muscle damage as well as liver damage. It's a mitochondrial enzyme. Uh, so probably ALT is a better marker for the liver specifically, but it can also go up in other things. Uh, the other difference is the half-life. ALT has a longer half-life, so AST goes up quicker and down quicker. ALT is slower, but ALT is more specific to the liver. In real life, they're interchangeable, to be honest. So it doesn't matter too much which one you have. If you're following a trend, you should follow one or the other. Um, another question, the role of alpha feta protein. Uh, in the neonate, uh, it's not relevant. It's extremely high when you're born and it comes down over the first weeks and months. So it's only relevant later when you obviously want to rule out uh, tumors, in particular hepatoblastoma. So we ask for it as a baseline, but then it's about following the trend. It's an enzyme that's uh, released when the liver is regenerating. So chronic liver disease may have a slightly high AFP, but really it's extremely high in AFP secreting tumors. So it's for that. Somebody's asking age reference ranges. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, they are just done from population data. Um, so you could look them up. They do vary from lab to lab, and they do slightly change with age, but the, the only main one that changes with age for, for our purposes is GAMMA DT, which is 150 at birth down to below 50 uh, in an older child, um, and AFP very high at birth down to undetectable uh, in an older child with no liver disease. But all labs slightly different. 
Okay, we'll get to a bit older. So just out of the neonatal period now, two months old uh, child. Uh, so this is a breastfed uh, baby, uh, referred by a GP after the mother expresses concerns with regard to jaundice. So this is a very common presentation to a GP. So mum's worried the baby's still jaundice, uh, nothing much else wrong with the baby. Uh, blood results are done. So have a think, think what you think about these blood results. Okay, so uh, most people say that conjugated bilirubin is very high, which is correct. One person said breast milk jaundice, which is wrong because it's conjugated bilirubin. And also this is a seven week old baby. So you must investigate everyone above two weeks with jaundice. Yeah, one person has noticed the gamma GT is high. So, which condition could it be? How did you figure out? You all want to rule out biliary atresia, which is correct. It could be any of those, really, but you want to rule out biliary atresia because you have to do something about it. Uh, so somebody asked earlier the role of gamma GT. So gamma GT is an enzyme on the bile ducts or the biliary epithelium. So it's high when there's a problem with the biliary uh, or the, the biliary system. So biliary atresia, where the bile duct is obliterated, there's an obstruction effectively, so you'll get a high gamma GT. So that's gamma GT. Okay. However, You'd write you want to rule out biliary atresia, but here are some of the causes of infantile cholestasis that just present with conjugated jaundice. So this is why when you do ring your uh, hepatology center, they give you a huge uh, list of investigations to be getting on with while awaiting uh, the or admission to the tertiary hospital. But again, there's good guidelines for this presentation. If you go on the British Society of Pediatric Gastrohepatology and Nutrition uh, website, you can find those guidelines that have been agreed nationally. And this is what I would direct people to uh, to start getting on with the investigations. This baby did have biliary atresia. The incidence is about one in 17,000 births, but does vary around the world. It's commonest in Taiwan or probably the Pacific, about one in 14 to 17,000 in Europe. We don't know the etiology. It's probably the end pathway of a number of etiologies. And a quarter of them have other developmental abnormalities such as malrotation, cardiac problems, and polysplenia. Uh, so it's possibly to do with cilia and the rotation uh, in the embryo as the organs go back in. Um, it's certainly related to those kind of abnormalities. And what it is really is the destruction of the extrahepatic bile duct. It's really called extrahepatic biliary atresia, but all of the patient also have abnormal intrahepatic bile ducts. They develop cholestasis, that's how they present. The liver becomes fibrotic, eventually cirrhotic. And if you can't excrete bile, you would die. So these children used to die by age two years without a decide procedure or a transplant. And the bilirubin level is moderately high and the gamma GT is generally very high because it's a ob completely obstructed um, system. I'm not sure if you can see that, but this uh, whole area is the uh, portal tract and it's got a lot of inflammatory cells in there. So there's an inflammatory 
uh, and edema in there in that portal tract. So it's a very biliary disease with inflammation in the bile ducts. And the bile ducts then start to proliferate to try and get around the lower down obstruction. So you see that as well. How do you diagnose it? Uh, so the blood test we saw, so typically uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with a high gamma GT would be the classic blood tests. Uh, next step is an ultrasound scan and there should be an abnormal gallbladder because the gallbladder is part of the extrahepatic uh, biliary tree. Uh, there's also a thing called a triangular cord sign, which is fibrosis around the port hepatis. That's not uh, the greatest sign, but some ultrasonographers uh, can uh, see that, others can't. Hydra scan, somebody mentioned the Hydra scan. Well, obviously, the bile would not excrete on a radionuclear scan. Uh, there's a much simpler, cheaper way of looking for that than doing a Hydra scan. Somebody might want to comment uh, on that. Uh, liver biopsy, as I said, it becomes fibrotic. The bile ducts try to proliferate to get around the extrapatic obstruction, obviously cholestasis. If you were to do an ERCP, obviously cannot inject the dye up the uh, bile ducts because they aren't there. And when they go to surgery, the surgeons try and inject dye into the biliary tree to try and visualize it to see if it's present or not. Obviously, they can't do it. So the easier way of doing a HIDA scan is to look at the baby's stool. If the baby's stool is white, there's no bile in that stool. So there's no bile being excreted. So that is the cheap, quick community way to see if uh, uh, bile has been excreted from the liver rather than admitting for an expensive test. So we really rarely do HIDA scans, certainly not for biliary atresia. It's generally easy to make the diagnosis without uh, doing that. So the management is the Kasai portoenterostomy. I'll show you what it is. Also to change the formula, they, uh, if you can't excrete bile, you can't absorb long chain triglycerides from your milk. Uh, and the fat soluble vitamins A, D, E, K that are in uh, the long chain triglycerides. So you would give a medium chain triglyceride formula and the fat soluble vitamins. Might need prophylactic antibiotics, might need urso deoxycholic acid, which is a bile acid that's uh, supposedly easier to excrete from the liver. You might need an enzyme inducer to help prevent the cholestasis. Uh, steroids, possibly, jury is out. That's if there's an inflammatory uh, component to the uh, biliary atresia, is possibly one of the causes. And it's a chronic disease, so a lot of family support uh, is required. This is a Kasai portoenterostomy, so there's no uh, extra hepatic bile duct. So what you do is bring up the jejunum to the porta hepatis and then reconnect. Uh, the end of the duodenum on the side there. So the food will go that way, and this is called the roux loop, and it's to drain the bile. That's Morio Kasai from Japan, uh, who invented this procedure. As I said, biliary trees is more common in the Far East, so um, that's where most of the data comes from. And the outcome, so about 30%, uh, of these babies don't clear their jaundice and they require a liver transplant within the first two years of life, uh, otherwise they die. Most of them though, two thirds, 70%, this Kasai is successful in the sense that they don't need a liver transplant in the first two years, but uh, a lot of them get infection or they already have quite severe liver disease or they get portal hypertension and they will end up with a liver transplant in childhood. And then finally, of those with a successful Kasai, minimal complications. Some still need a liver transplant later in life, even in early adulthood. But if the Kasai is done over 20 plus 25 years of follow up, but there's still 20% who have not needed a liver transplant. Still, very few of those uh, have normal liver function tests and a normal liver. Only you can count those on a handful, but still. 20% uh, not needing a liver transplant. 
So going through the questions, sort of answer that one. Is it possible to have biliary trees during a 3D arm? That's a good question. Uh, that would be an extremely rare presentation. It's more likely to be instacated bile from sepsis or dehydration. Uh, the reason it's a difficult question is there's many etiologies of biliary atresia and that it progresses over the first two months of life. It's more common to have people say they had pigmented stool, which gradually went pale, or nobody notices it at three days old, and so they never present at that age. Certainly, if we saw a baby with a pale stool at three days, would investigate with blood to know. What infections of prophylactic antibodies cover? Really, you need to cover gut organisms. Any broad spectrum antibiotic is uh, fine, to be honest. Conjugated hyperbilirubinemia in preterm infants. So, preterm infants on PN, you should be measuring their split bilirubin, and I would say you do that um, weekly if it's abnormal. Uh, if bilirubin is rising to 50 conjugated without a cause, you need to think about what's happening with that baby's liver and whether you can get them off parental nutrition. So if it's constantly rising and you can't make a change, that liver's in trouble. Um, let's look at this question. What happens when you investigate X-prem baby with conjugated jaundice, mild? Uh, persisting despite all the test negative. So those babies we just uh, monitor and usually it does settle as they uh, grow, so with time. So it start off monitoring that weekly, gradually go to two weeks, monthly, etc. And eventually it does uh, settle down over weeks to months. How long it does depend on the case. Uh, and yes, Abidec and vitamin K is enough. We just uh, monitor them and supplement the, the vitamin. Abidec and vitamin K is probably enough for most of those babies. You could give ADEK separately uh, if you want. Is Kasai time dependent? Yes, it's chronic liver disease. Once the bile duct is gone, the bile that's stuck in the liver is doing damage to that liver. So the longer you leave it, the less likely the Kasai is to be successful. So uh, the, the classic teaching or the original studies were at eight weeks, arbitrary cutoff, but we would say they should have the Kasai within eight weeks. Another one, how about normal transaminitis, normal synthetic function of triangular cord sign? Well, triangular cord sign is supposedly looking at fibrosis at the portal and suggests biliaratresia. Those studies have not been reproducible across all units. However, uh, I would get another ultrasound scan by another person if somebody said there was triangular cord sign. Uh, transaminases being abnormal need investigation. Uh, in biliary trees, they should have normal synthetic function when they present, if they present it early enough. If it's becoming abnormal, the liver is damaged. So that baby would need to be investigated. Okay. Different condition. Anybody knows know what this shows, these four pictures? Good. Everybody who's answered at least knows that one. I guess if you didn't know, you didn't answer. So in the top left picture, who knows what this is showing then? So somebody said that's triangular face. Somebody said that's the butterfly vertebra. What is this one and this one? Anybody know? Nobody knows. Okay, so this is xanthomas. Uh, cholesterol is... Um, is high in cholestatic diseases and allergial in particular. And this one, what allergial syndrome is, is no or paucity of bile ducts in the portal tract. So there's a vein, there's an artery, there should be a bile duct, there isn't one. Uh, so that's um, 
that is the feature of allergial syndrome in the liver. So rather than biliary atresia, it's biliary hypoplasia. It's an autosomal dominant uh, condition. Genes have been identified, associated with it, JAG1, less commonly NOTCH2. Um, it also associated with cardiac defects and in particular peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. Some of these children are more sick from the heart than they are from the liver. Obviously it's dominant, uh, so you often see the, the faces of their parent and you can make the diagnosis. Obviously the liver disease and cardiac disease can be very mild uh, in a lot of children or adults. The management, if you do have liver disease, is just nutrition and fat-soluble vitamins, like all chronic liver diseases, and they often suffer with pruritus, and so those are some treatments you can give for pruritus. And the outcome really depends entirely on the phenotype. So obviously a lot of people have a very mild phenotype and maybe never know they've got allergial syndrome. But then it depends on the severity of liver or cardiac disease. If you do present as an infant, uh, with liver disease, 50% of those have normal liver function by adolescence. But at the other end, there's end-stage liver disease and portal hypertension and pruritus, and those children go forward for liver transplant. So it's quite a relatively common cause of liver transplant in children. And the other thing that can present very similarly to uh, biliary atresia, uh, particularly in Northwest Europe, is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. You can see that it's much more common, one in 7,000 uh, births. Uh, and they have abnormal secretion of alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, and again, can present vulnerably to biliary atresia in children. Most of those will get better. Uh, a few of those have bad liver disease uh, and require a transplant. Obviously, in the long term, if the liver disease is not a problem, the lung disease is the later problem for these uh, children. So we follow them through childhood from a liver point of view and then put them into clinics where the adults might look at their lungs uh, later down the line. So they must never smoke. Another set of conditions that present with uh, cholestasis at that age is uh, familial intrahepatic cholestasis disorders. And that difference there is you can't put bile from the hepatocyte to the bile duct. So it's not a problem of the bile duct. It's a problem of the membrane between the hepatocyte and the bile duct. There's many different types of these conditions now are being found. There's different phenotypes. Um, and we look at them from a genetic basis now, rather than a phenotypic basis. So those were the three common ones, FIC1, BSEP, and MDR3 deficiency. They were called Byler's disease, and then they were called FIC1, 2, and 3. Then the genes were found, and now there's multiple of similar conditions, and we refer to them by the genetic problem. And where biliary atresia is a problem of the bile duct, allergy is a problem of not enough bile ducts, the intrahepatic cholestasis are a problem of the canalicular membrane of the hepatocyte. So to excrete bile, you need to excrete conjugated bilirubin from your cell to your uh, canaliculus. You need to excrete your bile acids and they need to form the mixed micelles with the phospholipids of the cell membrane. And so you need proteins to uh, put the phospholipids in the right place of the cell membrane and sort out the cell membrane. And a defect in any of those proteins in the cell membrane means you can't excrete the bile properly or can't form the mixed micelles properly. And those are the familial intrahepatic cholestasis. I would say we diagnose these by genetics now, and these are the kids that will get um, to the liver center once you've done your first line investigations, and it's not biliary atresia, for example, or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. We'll do genetics panels and look at them. So I won't talk too much about them. So we'll move out of babies uh, to later childhood, just to have a bit of time, I think. And a very different conditions present. It's not such, so common to present with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So there you go. You can see there's different ways they present. Again, they might present acutely. They might just present with poor hypertension. 
they might present with malnutrition, they might present with neurological problems. So a little bit uh, older, the girl is referred from another hospital with acute liver failure. So you can see the bloods there, uh, transaminases were very high, INR was very high. A lot of you were asking for uh, ammonias earlier, so uh, they did do an ammonia, you can see it's very high. So any thoughts? Okay, uh, drug induced, well, up and down over six months, so not one drug. Wilson's two years old, is very young for that. So you have to think ammonia. A couple of people are certainly thinking about ammonia. Yeah, so somebody, Kayla, says urea cycle, and that, let's have a look. That's correct. Was in fact urea cycle. Uh, defect. It's a girl, so I think she ultimately needed a liver transplant. She had recurrent acute liver failure uh, every time the urea cycle defect um, decompensated. So she was a partial OTC um, deficiency. One year older again, another high AST, 645 this time. Um, you do worry, but it's not acute liver failure for a change in this talk uh, because the INR is normal, 1.1. Any thoughts? So, some good thoughts, some people know. So. Which test would you do? Yeah. Okay. So that's because the transaminases, as I said, particularly AST, are present in the muscle. And so uh, everything else being normal for the liver, you must check the CK to check you're not missing a neuromuscular problem. And we do pick up Duchenne's and other uh, neuromuscular problems uh, when because of a high AST. So a simple test to do uh, to check. Okay, let's get to a few older children. Okay, so this boy is 10. Uh, he had a fit seizure, so he's referred for further investigations. Obviously, he had an EEG, it was normal. He had a CT head, it was normal. Uh, not really much to find on examination. No signs of chronic liver disease. BMI a little bit high at 32, or quite high for his age. And his blood test showed that ALT was 85, but everything else was normal. They did a liver ultrasound next. And there was fat in the liver, what looked like fat in the liver. So a few of you have been answering, but here's the question. It's not which condition do you think it is, but which condition must you exclude? and think about why. Okay, yeah, so you must exclude Wilson. And the reason you must exclude Wilson uh, disease is it's treatable, okay? May well have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but that's not going to do him much harm acutely. May have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. You can't really treat that in childhood and he's well. If it's hepatitis A, it'll go away. So the one you really need to diagnose with serious uh, consequences is Wilson disease.
And Wilson disease uh, is not common, it's an autosomal recessive condition. Again, often diagnosed on genetics now, though there's many uh, mutations that can cause it, so it can be quite hard to pick up if you don't know the mutation. Uh, and it's abnormal copper uh, transport, and so it accumulates in the liver, in the brain, and in the cornea. And the presentation can be anything from uh, insidious, like that patient, if he had Wilson's disease, right through to acute liver failure, where they needed urgent transplant. In fact, I did one just a couple of weeks ago. Um, or intensely in adults, neurological problems, seizures, etc. That's unusual in children, but occasionally. So you always have to think of Wilson's. It presents in older children, so we have had one about years old, but um, that's very unusual. So it tends to be older children. Of course, often found now when you screen siblings. Uh, so low ceruloplasmin is a, a good feature. So we ask you to check ceruloplasmin as part of the workup for hepatitis. Um, that's the transport protein. They also commonly present with hemolysis. So we occasionally get referrals from the hemologist with Wilson's disease. To really help you make the diagnosis, you look for copper in the urine and you give them a copper chelator to help them excrete. And obviously that's very high because they're storing too much copper. So that's a good diagnostic test. On the liver biopsy, again, you measure the amount of stored there. Uh, those are the features. And then finally, say there's many mutations. Uh, so it can be difficult if you don't already know the mutation in that family. So it can be a tricky diagnosis uh, to make. You can see the eye there with the brown Kaiser Fleisch ring, so they should all be sent for ophthalmology as well. Treatment is the copper key. Later, somebody asks how effective are they? If you get the Wilson disease early enough, then they're very effective. So in siblings or early pickups, very effective and they should be fine on chelators for life. If they're presenting with serious liver disease or very acutely, um, they need a liver transplant. And some of them, the liver is already so damaged that they more, present more chronically, but they'll still need a liver transplant. Uh, but if early enough, chelators are good. Uh, and then obviously testing the family. The gene. Uh, those two like eating fast food, obviously, thickening now uh, that the lockdown is easing, uh, but they haven't necessarily got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So even if you see a fat child with fat on the liver ultrasound, you have to exclude other conditions that are associated with steatosis in the liver. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a diagnosis of exclusion. So look for also and treat everything from metabolic syndrome uh, as well, because they might just be presenting liver first, but have other problems. A non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is a spectrum. The prevalence is very variable depending on the uh, study you look at. Do they have symptoms? Uh, some of them do have symptoms. Uh, often present with tiredness or joint pains or constipation, very general things. Uh, often being obese, have a lot of problems in the background with bullying, schooling, etc., things like that. Okay, diagnosis really is exclusion. So often they do come to liver biopsy, it's really to exclude other liver diseases. And the best treatment remains weight reduction uh, and physical activity, and you can reverse the findings in the liver if you manage to do those things. Uh, a lot of uh, anti-inflammatories, vitamins, uh, things like that have been looked for as treatments, but none of them have been particularly good treatments yet. Excuse me. That's histology of normal hepatocytes. Those uh, blobs uh, where it's washed out are fat. So that's how a normal liver looks on histology. That's how a fatty liver looks. That's how a normal liver looks if you were to remove it. I don't know why to remove a normal liver, but that's what it looks like. And that's what a fatty liver looks like. So think pate, foie gras pate is how it looks like. So do your exercise and eat healthily, I would say. 
Okay, getting to the older end of pediatrics now. So a 14 year old girl, two weeks history, quite vague history, but a little bit jaundiced, lethargy, has been losing weight. Uh, it's obviously been going on a little while. Here's her bloods. So I and R, you see that, bilirubin. Quite high ALT, very high ALT. Have a look, see what you think about the albumin. Okay. So there's your question. What are you going to talk to the family about? Okay. So some people are saying acute liver failure. By definition, it's not acute liver failure only because the INR hasn't reached the level of two for one reason. And another reason, if you look back, the symptoms have been going on for four weeks. So it's not such uh, an acute, acute presentation. So it can't be acute liver failure. The people who answered A are correct. And the reason you can know that from those bloods, does anybody know, does anybody want to guess or put a, put a comment how they knew that they were going to talk about immunosuppression? Yeah, so Kemi is right, Kate is right. So the total protein is high. The albumin is low. So the albumin may be low because this is a chronic liver disease in the background. And the difference between the albumin and the total protein is your globulin. And most globulin is IgG. So this is suggesting there's high IgG, which obviously fits with an autoimmune condition. So autoimmune liver disease, and you need to treat that with immunosuppression. How would you confirm this diagnosis? Yeah, the answer's all. So we know it's autoimmune. We, we, we're clever and knew about the total protein. Uh, so that's A, that's going to give you your answer that you already knew, but you still need to exclude uh, Wilson disease and viral because it could both viral hepatitis and Wilson disease can present pretty similarly. So you're not going to rely totally starting immunosuppression just on a high total protein. So you do have to rule out the other uh, causes of liver disease. Okay, so this is about autoimmune hepatitis, and you can access the presentation, um, so you can uh, read it at your leisure. It quite commonly in children presents more acutely and more aggressively than it does in uh, older people. It's a bit of a different condition. There's two types, slightly different uh, ways of presenting and prognosis, and both of those are quite different to how adults present. This, if you look at that bile duct, it looks like onion skin. That's fibrobrittic cholangitis and the fibrosis going around the bile ducts. And that's what you see in sclerosing cholangitis, which is common autoimmune in children, uh, burnt out or not autoimmune in adults. And there's a few differences between childhood autoimmune sclerosing cholangitis and adult primary sclerosing cholangitis. Okay, so just whipping through some things at the end. So chronic liver diseases, that's the normal liver we saw earlier. That's what a cirrhotic liver looks like. An explant, you can see it's very fibrotic and the liver's trying to regenerate in between the fibrosis. That's the normal biopsy. And that's what cirrhosis looks like with huge areas of fibrosis uh, going around the lobule. And the classic features are jaundice, pruritus, malnutrition, and often the social and developmental problems in children because they're very sick for a long time. 
It can be life-threatening, and the most common life-threatening problem is cholangitis or septicemia, and then portal hypertension. And ultimately, it progresses to end stage, and these need liver transplant. One of the things you can do is uh, treat the nutrition, uh, so the cholestasis, so vitamins and calories, uh, and also uh, extra nutrition. They need more calories than other people, and it's a prognostic factor. So the management is one, trying to find the cause, as we've been talking about in this talk, but also treating the comorbidities uh, and optimizing uh, care for the family and supporting them. And if they need a transplant, it's about getting them in as good a health as possible prior to the transplant. If they do get to transplant, there's a huge multidisciplinary team, and we liaise a lot um, with local services to look after these children. They have a big assessment. Everything is treated that can be. And then monitor closely between the tertiary center and the local uh, teams whilst on the waiting list. Afterwards, it's our job to get that graft functioning in a good environment. But again, once they've gone home, it's about sharing care between the transplant center for transplant related problems and the local team and general paediatricians for all of the other problems and support. There's many long-term problems and it's about being vigilant for those. So we have big shared care with general paediatrics. Okay, you can read this later. So this is top 10 tips for general paediatricians uh, in hepatology. So you must investigate prolonged neonatal jaundice. You must look at the stool. You must supplement their nutrition. Nowadays, it's a lot of it is genetics. So it's a lot of genetics panels and genetic diseases. If you suspect tumors, don't forget to do an alpha feed protein for tumor markers. They should all be vaccinated. That will prevent Hep B, for example, in this country, if only it was on the ski. Don't forget to check clotting. Always treat sepsis, not different to general paediatrics. Uh, if you're seeing fatty liver, don't assume it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Exclude all the other diseases that cause fatty liver and then treat all the other problems of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, uh, hypertension, etc. And the 11th top tip is really about communication, collaboration and shared care. Thank you. So that's the end. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and it gave you some pointers. We're slightly over time. Okay, thanks for joining.